So, as we gather in this place, we remember with gratitude that we live and worship on lands that are by law the unceded territories of the Big Mama. May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. Show us the way of reconciliation if possible. 
Lift any guilt that we may have from us so that we may walk in freedom and grace in our relationships with you and with others. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we have prepared, I call you now to worship. Come, let us gather as a community of faith. We gather as one despite our pandemic separation. Come, let us be reconciled to God and each other. We commit to the ministry of reconciliation. Let us celebrate God's presence. Our heavens fill us with love and
Somehow over the years, I kind of learned what was right and what was wrong along the way. But one of the nice things about the parents that I had that a lot of people don't experience was that they were pretty much unconditionally loving towards me. I never felt like I had to be good enough in order for them to love me. I knew they loved me first, and so I tried to be good enough. But it was never the other way around. And it was such a wonderful childhood. And it reminded me of God loving us first. Now, God would probably speak a little bit clearer than my uncle did in that story to us today. God would say, that's wrong. You're hurting people. Stop it. I love you, and so I'm telling you to stop it because I love you and I love them. But God would speak up and say that. And that's going to be important when it comes to what I want to speak to you about in the main scripture and message today. Whatever you loose on earth 
will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in his name, I am there among them. Through the reading of the scripture, may you hear the word of God. Thank you. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, how are you folks here today and watching with dealing with conflict? <laughs> in your families, and of course every family has a little bit of it, at least a little bit in the community, in your workplace, and maybe even in the church. Oh, oh yes, in the church. We have to acknowledge that conflict happens in the church, sometimes too much. There's a little sign on the church in Gaspar. I don't know if I mentioned this already to you or not, but I love it. It says right out in front of the Baptist church in, in Gaspar, behind Wolfville, there's a church there that says, this church is not a haven for good people, for saints, but a hospital for sinners. <laughs> I, I, love, I love the sign. That kind of humility is at the core of Jewish and Christian values, as, as I said earlier when I was talking to you about prayers of confession. Anyway, back to conflict. If you are like me, you're not very good at conflict, and probably your default setting is one of avoidance. You, know? you try to understand why it is that this person who hurt you said and did what they said, and then you forgive them and you try to forget it. One of my colleagues once told me uh, that I was a peacemaker at all costs, and I was kind of like a black lab <laughs> as, a, as a dog you know, what their temperament is like. I wasn't really a great disciplinarian as a parent, either. Now, uh, there are a lot of people who aren't too bad at confrontation when it comes to doing it on social media, you know, on a Twitter or a, or a Facebook post or something else. But the question really is, how are you at it when it comes to doing it face to face? Most of us don't like conflict, and we steer clear of it in our families, especially in churches. You know the old saying, you know, when you get together with family, don't talk about politics, religion, or sex. And my response is, you know, what else is there that's interesting? You know, but anyway, that's another story. But you know what? When conflicts happen in churches, they always seem worse. I, I once had an office administrator who had never worked in a church before, and after about a week she hired, she came into my office hyperventilating, and she said, Oh, I just got torn a strip off by a member of the core congregation, and this is a church. <laughs> it's like she thought she worked for a church that would never happen the way it does in other places. But it does seem worse sometimes when it happens in churches. But really, how many churches have I been over the years that when I first arrived, one of the things that the session asked me to do was to go and visit some family that used to be really active in the church but were no longer active in the church because of some kind of upset that happened in the past that was still unresolved. You know? Or how many churches, uh, I think you know, a lot of churches have bullies, uh, and yet they're allowed to not be confronted and not be challenged in their behavior. And people would say, oh, well, that's just so-and-so, you know, you got to accept them. And yet, their behavior causes a cloud across the whole congregation. And it's not just the congregants and the minister, but amongst themselves as well. So avoidance doesn't always work. Avoidance is not always the best policy. Uh, now, uh, there was, uh, let's see,
think I got these in order for we'll see. Now, there are some folks that thrive on conflict. People like uh, our friend, the president to the south. But I think that people like him are in the minority, at least I hope they are. I like to avoid conflict so much that I was going to avoid preaching on this passage from Matthew today because it talked about it. Uh, and then I read the part from Ezekiel, the prophet that was read, which basically it says, you know, uh, God is saying to Ezekiel the prophet, look, if I give you a message that is hard for people to hear and you don't say it, then I'm going to hold you responsible when calamities happen. And so, uh, as my responsibility to you folks, I need to deal with this passage today. Uh, life is about healthy and loving relationships with God and with each other. And all of us who are followers of Jesus of Nazareth are called to a ministry of reconciliation. That means that while forgive and forget may actually be a good thing to do in many minor situations, in others it can be the least helpful thing for both you and for the person who may, who may be alienating themselves from you and from others, and they may not even be aware of what they're doing and hurting themselves and others in the process, because, of course, we all have blind spots to the things that we do. Now, reconciliation, the thing that we're called to, truth-telling, has many different parts. First off is just that, telling the truth. And that's often the hardest part, saying the truth that needs to be spoken. Secondly, if we're lucky, the person that is being told this hard truth will say, yeah, you're right. But they don't always do that, do they? They don't always say, yeah, you're right. So secondly, for reconciliation in this process needs to happen is not only acknowledged and confessed, and then third, if there's some damage that can be undone, and sometimes there's nothing you can do, but sometimes there is some kind of restitution you can make that tries to make up for some of the things that have happened, and, uh, and then people need to commit themselves to a new way of behaving. And by the way, uh, changing behavior is hard. People can change, but it takes work, and it takes time. And we need to be patient with people as they kind of work through things. But it, it can happen. And then finally, when they've come to a, a place where, where the person who's offended can actually say, I forgive you. Let's go on and start again. And let's, at that point, forgive. And by the way, this policy or this process of reconciliation can't just happen between me and God or you and God. It has to involve the people too. Kind of praying your sins and asking God to forgive you when you don't do anything about your relationships with the people you've hurt doesn't work. Alcoholics Anonymous have that one very clearly right. You need to make amends if you can. And at any point in this process, it can break down. And so that brings us to Matthew's verses that we read today. And I say Matthew because I'm not exactly sure how much of this reading goes back to Jesus himself. Jesus really didn't talk about the church. That wasn't in the cards for him. He wasn't looking to make a new religion, right? So I, some of that stuff, scholars say, comes from uh, the gospel writers rather than Jesus. But after the truth is spoken, there are some, maybe many, who will deny that it's true. And they just won't admit it. They dismiss the charge as a personal attack on them to hurt them and not help them. The Matthew passage says, this is what we should do first. Approach the person one on one. Don't gather a whole army at first. No, go one on one to the person. Tell them how they've hurt you. And if they say, I'm sorry, all the good. End of story. However, if they don't, then you move to the second stage. I think one-on-one -on -one is a pretty good advice. It's the least embarrassing, and it has the best chance of a good outcome, I think. And so, 
As I begin my ministry with you here in Clifton Pastoral Church, I want to make a request of you today. If for some reason I tip you off, either by what I say or do or by what I don't say or do, please come and talk to me directly. Don't gossip, don't start rumors, don't uh, get an army. Just come and talk to me directly about it and we probably can resolve stuff pretty quickly because I have no illusions that I am perfect. Uh, so I ask you to do that. Uh, the, now, uh, in contrast to that, the president, our friend I was talking about earlier from the States, I don't think he ever made any made a mistake in his life. <laughs> he, he just doesn't make any mistakes, he's perfect. And, uh, but then again, he and the truth, not only about himself, but other things, are kind of strangers. So, that's another thing. If there's anyone here listening today who thinks they are perfect or need, is it not? Is there anyone here today who thinks they have to be perfect in order to be loved? There are some folks that feel that way, you know. If I'm not perfect, nobody will love me. If I, God won't love me, nobody else will love me. I mean, what a way to live. What a way to live. I feel so sorry for you if you feel you have to be perfect in order to be worthy of love. If that's the case, none of us are worthy of love. And it's no wonder that there are so many people that think that way because every advertisement that you have ever seen kind of preaches that message. You know? First they say, look, you are not perfect. People aren't going to love you, but if you buy our product or service, you will be perfect and then people will love you. That's kind of the unspoken message to so many commercials and ways of selling things in our society. If you are perfect and you are unworthy to be loved, what a lie that is. If you ever felt you were not good enough, from your parents, and you didn't receive that kind of unconditional love that I was lucky enough to have received, then you need to know today the good news. God unconditionally loves you, just the way you are, warts and all. God unconditionally loves you. God's love is not dependent on your perfection or your sinlessness. And when you really believe that, wow, what a kind of freedom, spiritually, psychologically, that can give you. It gives you a freedom to admit your mistakes and learn from them in a way that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Now, when I was teaching students about preaching, I used to tell them, you can have one hero story in your sermon. All the other stories that you tell about yourself need to be ones where you screwed up <laughs> and learned from. But you can have one hero story. So this is sort of my hero story today, and I promise you won't hear too many more of these today. When I was the conference president a few years ago, the mood of the annual meeting of conference was really testing, to say the least. It was a time of anger, and people were angry because a brand new conference office building had been purchased and we needed to pay for it and that meant allocations to pastoral charges had to go up. And so people were actually pretty furious about it. I don't know if you remember that time or not. That wasn't that many years ago. After some business sessions that we had, which contained more heat than light, it was time for me to give my annual report. And uh, frankly, I didn't even realize I had to give one until the last minute. And so I decided I was going to do something a little bit different, rather than talk about all the places I'd been, etc. I decided that I would make an apology to the conference. I would apologize for how all of this happened. How the conference was just over and then we had to sell the building in June, right after the conference. How there had been lots of minutes leading up to this about the needs of repair.
theirs for the old building, but I haven't really paid attention to them in the conference executive minutes. Uh, how uh, we hadn't really empathized with the pastoral charges that were struggling so hard to make ends meet, and then just raised the allocations. And what was kind of interesting in that process was that something happened that nobody was expecting, including me. What resulted from that report was that in about an hour, uh, David Hewitt, who was executive secretary at the time, reported that he had just in the last hour received $65,000 worth of donations and pledges for the new building. For the new building. That uh, it had made a difference in terms of what I had done. And I didn't know, I didn't say it for that reason, and I didn't know that was going to happen. But there is power in saying, I'm sorry, and really meaning it. Everybody knows that you and I are not perfect, it's not a secret. Matthew goes on to say that if a person refuses to admit their own, then get another person, a second person, to go with you, a second testimony, a second witness, if you will, so that the offender knows it's not just a personal attack. That's not a bad idea either. You know, get somebody else who's willing and cares enough about the person to confront them with you about their behavior and how it's hurting people. Okay? Uh, in our system with ministers, it's often the MD committee that does that in the church. You know, the MP will come with the person, or if the person is unsuccessful, the MP will come and talk to us and say, you know what, what that person was saying, Philip, you know, they, they had a point. You know, you need to kind of watch that and, and say you're sorry. And if I refuse to admit it at the beginning, then hopefully I will admit it at that point. Blessed are the peacemakers, and a good MP committee can go a long way facilitate resolution of conflicts between ministers and congregations and congregants and themselves over the years. I've seen it work. Peace and harmony and happiness in community are bound up with truth and fairness and forgiveness and trust. All of those things need to go together. So as I begin my time with you in Clifton Pastoral Charge, I want to urge you to finish up any unfinished business you may have before I got here with, with some of your congregants or with some of your ministers or whoever. You know, don't let those things fester. Address them. If you can't truly forgive and forget, then address them so that we can all move forward with a fresh new leaf here as I begin with you this next leg of the Life of Faith journey. Even if this passage doesn't date back in its entirety to the words of Jesus, the fact is that in the church, where we know we're not perfect, and yet still unconditionally loved by God, we have a freedom that others may not have to be reconciled, not only with God, but with each other, because we can admit our mistakes and our sins. So take a chance. This should be good news overall. Do the hard work of reconciliation, do it for yourself, do it for other persons who God loves, do it for the health and the happiness of our church family. And let's not give up on the possibility of anybody having a change in their lives. Let's ask the Spirit to come and help us transform. Amen.
Deaf Ministry in Newfoundland. Mission and Service has been supporting the Deaf Ministry in Newfoundland and Labrador for 33 years. In 1987, the School for the Deaf in St. John's wrote a letter to the local presbytery requesting pastoral care on behalf of the United Church. Beverly Ayers, a lay delegate, was asked to consider the role. She was interested but concerned that she didn't know the sign language. Nonetheless, she answered the call, first as a volunteer and then as an employee. Beverly began learning American Sign Language and also took courses in theology. She was a quick study. Over the next 23 years, she served the students and their families as an interpreter of worship services at First United Church in Mount Pearl, as a faith formation leader in, at the school, as an advocate for the deaf community, and as a pastoral care provider and friend. But by 2010, the enrollment was greatly declining and the provincial government decided to close the school. Thanks to the vision and commitment of a local ecumenical committee, the deaf ministry continued. Today, Beverly and others continue to provide community worship leadership and pastoral care to the deaf community in and around St. John's. Thanks to the support of local churches and mission and service, individuals like Beverly have made a real difference in the lives of many deaf children and adults and families. Nancy Amberley, a former student, says, while I attended church regularly as a child, I didn't understand who God was until I met Beverly. Nancy is now a teacher and has replaced Beverly as the coordinator of deaf ministry in Newfoundland. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. Loving our neighbor is, is at the heart of our mission and service. At this point in the service, uh, if we have people here, we would be accepting the offering. Uh, the offering is a response that we make as an act of worship for all the gifts of life and love that God has given to us. And so we give thanks for that today. There is a way we built it that you can give your offering through uh, slot in the door, I believe, into a box, and here offerings will be accepted between 11 and 12 on Sunday mornings. Would you think with me now the new creed? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, and life and death and life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now would you join me in our prayers of the people, our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let's pray. Loving Creator God, Spirit, Holy One, in whom we live and move and have our being. We come this day to worship you and to give you thanks for all your gifts of life and love to us. Most of us gathering and listening to this today are, have lived privileged lives and we take so much for granted. This pandemic has certainly shown how much. We thank you, God, that despite other forces at work in our lives, you are a force of love and goodness at the center of the universe, at the center of all things guiding us and seeking our health and wholeness. 
We pray today, especially today, for children and parents and governments and principals and teachers trying to negotiate going back to school amid a pandemic. We thank you for where we live in the world and in North America, but even so, even here, it's stressful. Help all of these folks deal with the stress and give them wisdom about the decisions they make and keep us all safe. We give thanks for all those essential workers that have been working all the way through this pandemic, and we pray for their safety. We pray for others who have not been able to work and who are feeling the financial stress of not having a regular paycheck. We pray for adequate testing, for vaccines sooner than later, and for, or, and for a return to something a little closer to what we used to call normal in terms of safety and freedom of movement. We give thanks for the benefits, ironically, of this crazy time as well. The opportunity to reassess life and our values, to make changes that we've been putting off, to develop new ways of doing things that in some cases are even better than the old. Help us, O oh God, find ways to strengthen community even as we listen to science and physical distance. We pray for the healing and wholeness of all those who are sick in body, in mind, and in spirit. We pray for those who have lost loved ones during this time, including members of our own congregations. Give our churches and our communities wisdom and guidance in how to proceed as we prepare to open. We pray for the leaders of our community, our province, our country, and other parts of the world. We pray especially for the people of the United States dealing with high pandemic numbers and increasing anxiety over elections coming in November. Everyone and everything is so interconnected, God. This time has made it so clear that we can no longer live in isolation or in denial about our interconnectedness. We pray for all those suffering financially, as I said. Show us our best to care for these folks. We pray as well for all those people whose skin color is not white. Show us how to act against racism, against blacks and Asian, indigenous peoples, Hispanics, and all other peoples. It, we're, we're, racist, we're racist in ways we don't even realize. God, help us not only to be non-racist, but anti-racist. Help us to model loving community for all creatures in all creation, because black lives and other color lives matter. And now, O oh God, we bring you our individual prayers of thanksgiving and intercession in silence for a moment.
Give them anything.